So let's go ahead and get started. But I want to pull out something you just said. And you said it in passing, but I want to make sure like people hear it because I want to inquire deeper into it. And you're talking about that Zantac case. You're saying three years from now, right? To you right now, that's a no-brainer. Someone else hears three years. Three years sounds like a long time. But why is, you know, in your view, because it's, this seems like a, you know, the, the people that are really stressing out short game, thinking that way versus the ones that are thinking perhaps longer term. And to you, three years might not even be long term. But just, I guess, talk to me, you know, in terms of like basically not only what you just said, but why you believe that's such a no brainer now. You have to make a choice, right? You have to make a choice on how you're going to behave today, right? If you want to behave today to keep the lights on today, find something that you can do to bring income in today. If you've been a PI player, you're used to playing a long game. We play the long game on everything. Everything, I mean, even auto accident cases take six to 10 months, right? So if you need cash in the door today, go be a bankruptcy lawyer. I mean, like if you need it, go and get yourself, I mean, bankruptcy clients are gonna happen in the next you know, 30 days, they're gonna start calling, right? So if you need cash and you can't afford to wait 30, you know, 10 days, but if you've been a contingency player You've got access to capital. There's lots of people out there that can help you make the the hump over the hump of like bringing the cases in now and getting there in the future. Find the way to do it, right? John Morgan was on your program and he said, yeah, there's risk, right? When he talked to somebody in Indiana, great guy. He said, but John, that's all I have in the equity in my house. I could lose it. And he goes, yeah, you could. There's risk, right? We all have to bear risk. If you can't bear risk, you need to go work for somebody. So- and I, by the way, I, I agree with you. I want to just dissect that because a lot of people hearing that what is a no brainer to you may not be a no brainer to somebody else. And it's really thinking about, you said, okay, go become a bankruptcy lawyer. Someone might hear that and say, but I'm not a bankruptcy lawyer. Like in your view, it seems like Brian, you're very adaptable. You will do what needs to be done to maintain and make sure that there's stability and success for the practice, for your family, for your team and so on. But why is that so much easier for you? I, I wish I could give you a good answer on why I'm adaptable. I mean, it, it's funny. My friend and I uh, talk about our wives, right? So my best friend and I are very adaptable people. And we would joke, you know, like if my wife comes in and the temperature is 69 degrees in the house, I'm comfortable, right? And she's like, it's freezing in here. And so she'll turn up the temperature. And then it'll get to 82 and I'm comfortable. And she's like, it's boiling in here. And so if it's not like 72 to 75, the, it's miserable for her in the house, right? And I'm good, like 64 to like 87, I'm good. You know, like I'm just adaptable. I've got a good friend of mine. We had a, a poor woman who, who died, her son died. And I went into a, a black community, black church. He and I were the only two white people in the church. And I was comfortable because they're good people and we're just talking, right? Like there's no feeling of non-adaptability to that. I'm a, I'm a Jewish guy from the Midwest. My wife is a Cuban woman who came from a very Cuban family. I didn't speak a lick of Spanish when I got here and they're immersed in Spanish every day in their household. I learned it. We move on. It's great. I love the culture. I feel like after 30 years, I'm more Cuban than I am Jewish at this point. I mean, you, you just, you have to like be adaptable if you want to be in business. So, so then I guess through that experience, let's say over the last eight weeks, what's been the biggest lesson that you've learned? That there's more opportunity now than there was before the COVID emergency. Okay. okay. There's more opportunity out there now because every Black Swan event like this leads to incredible opportunity, right? And the only thing you need to know is that you have faith that this country is going to move forward and that we're going to have the same commercial environment in six weeks as we had 12 weeks ago. I mean, not, it could be changed in some way, but we're not going to be communists. We're not going to be taken over by government. We're going to be able to invest in our businesses, in our future. We're going to be able to create and build in this country. We have a wonderful platform of, of laws and rights that allow us a social compact to go forward in business and do good by our community and the problems you solve the bigger the problem, the bigger the payday. So go solve some big problems and make a payday happen. Now, there's always people that are going to be watching this, and there's always the skeptic who's thinking, okay, that person, they won't say optimistic, they'll say delusional, but how is all this optimism and proactivity been working out for you? I mean, like I said, uh, we have one division of our firm that's 400% up right now. 
since COVID. So we're 400%, we're four times, we're doing four times the business that we were previously. Uh, the business that you would think is sunk into nothing, like workers' compensation, who's at work right now, is flat. I mean, we haven't lost one iota of time. Our auto accidents are a little down, but, uh, but our social security practice is way up. I mean, we're 20, 25% up in social security. So, you know, judging by the world, we're putting our money where we believe the opportunity is and the opportunity is paying off. Yeah. Now, coming out of this, uh, I, you know, we've said that there's gonna be firms that are being proactive now, they're gonna come out better in law firms than they came in. What are some of the ways in which you, you believe you're, you're making improvements now that may have either been put off or maybe this is the catalyst behind that, that makes your firm a better firm coming out of COVID? So it's interesting because what, what this has done is it has shown me that what I had going on here in the office, which I thought was a really good tight knit group of people, were really not communicating in the office as much and as well as we're communicating out of the office in the remote environment. So we prepared, like I told you in 2005, we had all those hurricanes roll through. So I prepared for us to be remote back in 2005 and we've been building on that platform ever since. We make a very deep dive in technology in this firm. Um, so when this happened, it took about 20 minutes to send everybody home remote. We were ready to do this beforehand. So phones were all remote, pick up your laptop, go home, start working, done, like done. This is my cell phone, is my, is my office phone. They match, they do, you know, they're all together. Super easy for us at that level. What was interesting is that I've recognized in watching our communications through, we use Click, Zoho, uh, team type product, the amount of communication that we're getting now and the cooperation from our teams that were siloed beforehand. So they're sitting together in the office and they're siloed, right? And here, they're, not, they're, they're out of the silo. There's more communication. So I need to bring that back, and I can't let that slide now that we've made that progress. Yeah. Well, Ed, what would be your prediction? Let's say six months from now, nine months from now, how have things changed in, in the legal landscape? I think that there's going to be a number of people who have either gone to work for the people who come out of this strong or are muddling through trying to figure out how to come back from it. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be 20% of us that are probably going to be in a much better spot than we were a year ago. Now let's, uh, let's get offensive in the sense that I know you mentioned this earlier and, and I want to dig into this, but you mentioned that many people are perhaps should realize or are realizing that perhaps they're in the wrong role. Maybe they shouldn't be running an organization. Maybe they shouldn't be the leader. Maybe they shouldn't be the CEO. Uh, why do you think that? I think that there's a lot of people, myself included, who are strong egoed. And uh, we've gone out and we've created a sense of uh, capacity. I think we probably have, and I certainly had for many years, um, a uh, inaccurate view of my business acumen. I mean, how old are you, Mike? Michael, 34. 34. So I'm, I'm 20 years your senior, a little more. And I think that your business acumen is significantly better than mine. I mean, clearly, you understand how to run a business and watching your business grow and being able to understand the business lessons. And I've read the books. I mean, like, I know you're probably a Lencioni fan, right? Like Patrick Lencioni and, and the business books that are out there, right? So I've had to learn that stuff. And it doesn't come naturally to me, right? What I like to do is I like to, I'm an entrepreneur. I like to start it. I like to build it. I like to sell it. I like to get out there and bring it in. I'm a good rainmaker, but I'm not a good human manager. I'm really not. I'm not a great manager. And it took me a long time to learn what my best role was. And I think that I, I've watched a lot of my, especially PI compatriots, but even divorce lawyers and such, they, they think that they're good businessmen, but what they were, were they, they were good technicians and money, because they were making good money, washes away a lot of bad business. You know, I thought I was brilliant because I'm making money hand over fist. But the minute money got tight, like I got tight in 2009. Things didn't, uh, hubris can overcome us all. So I, I had my down and uh, we changed a little bit in 2009 from that. And I learned that 
I was not a brilliant businessman. I was not a brilliant real estate investor. And that was a very hard lesson for me. Um, but, uh, but you learn, right? So you live and you learn and you, you, you adapt and you move on. There's a lot of guys that are going to learn that they're not very good business people. And in a downturn economy, when your industry goes south, if you're not a good business person and you haven't been doing the things that are necessary to run a good business, this hurts you bad. How many people out there have six months of working capital in the bank? Yeah. Yeah. You're exposed. You I, I, I have an agreement. I mean, you're exposed. It, it, businesses are exposed. Leaders are exposed. Teams are exposed. And it's, it's really, if you gather, gather enough acorns for the winter, if you ran your business in a way where there were the right systems set up, you you're cloud based, like that you had contingency plans, you're probably doing fine. If you didn't do any of that stuff, I had basically ignored it and said, hey, I don't have to ever worry about it. Well, now you're, you're probably in a world of pain, which you can get through and you can put all those systems in place. Uh, but what we're seeing is not as many are. Like they're, they're not saying, hey, you know what? Like this is a wake up call. We've got to make the business better because I never want to have the situation happen again. Many yeah. are just rolling over. You know, it's, it's that preparation for the black swan, right? Like we think that things aren't going to happen, right? But they're, they're always happening. Like when hasn't there been a black swan event? There's a constant stream of black swan events. You must make yourself um, anti-fragile. You know, like I, I told you about the Taleb book. I love that concept of black swan events and learning to be anti-fragile so that you're prepared and the strong survive. And you look at these events as opportunities, not as tragedies. I mean, they're clearly tragic. I mean, God, we all, our hearts go out for anybody sick and anybody that's passed and any family members that have passed. I mean, I don't know if you heard, but down here, there was a couple uh, that passed that were, uh, they, they passed hours apart from each other. They were related to one of my, my paralegals. And so we all felt it here for her. So it's terrible and tragic, but uh, it is what it is, right? It is an opportunity. And yeah. commercially, it's going to be a very significant opportunity for a lot of people in a lot of ways. And Brian, to close this out, so I know you're, you're 20 years my senior, and yet you're still uh, schooling me on the Peloton, so I, I commend you. Uh, but what, if, what, is, what are some of the things that you've been doing to stay sharp? Well, exercise. I mean, you know, what, what was it? There's that six doctors that you should always, you know, go to to stay healthy and stay sharp. And one of them is diet. One of them is exercise. One of them is sleep. One of them is friends, you know. So you need to pay attention to all of these things that are, are just healthy, smart ways of living, right? Mm -hmm. And when this happens, a lot of people fall into a funk. This is actually a, a great way to close out because in, in speaking with so many firm owners, I'm speaking with ones in the exact same type of situation, in the exact same type of market, same practice area. One views it as an opportunity as being proactive. Another is doom and gloom and is furloughing the majority of their staff, cutting back, preparing for their worst year ever. We've grown by six people. Yeah. I mean, I'm out there, man. Let's hire, hire. And if there's great talent out there, call me. Like if you're in South Florida and you are a paralegal, uh, you've got talent, you're a good person and you got furloughed, give me a call. I love it. I love it, Brian. Thank you, sir. I'll use that as my advertisement for the firm because it's hard to find good people. I love it. I love it. Brian, this is awesome, man. Thank you very much. Thank you, brother. I'll see you Saturday morning.